The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. One of the gifts near-death experiencers sometimes receive from the other side is the knowledge of future events, both for their own lives and for the rest of the world. Our return guest, Kenneth Lett, is one of those individuals. Ken is an old friend to NDE radio listeners. His near-death experience at the age of eight is most fully described in our shows of November 9 and 16, 2015, and he was most recently on our show of December 10, 2018. You can find these fascinating discussions by hitting the Past Shows button to reach our NDE radio archive. From visiting his ancestors, the entity Ken calls Mother led him to a place where he saw the Earth mounted on a pedestal. There, a future scenario of our planet was shown to him, though Mother shielded the eight-year-old from memories too painful for a child to bear. As an adult, however, some of those ominous memories have been returned to him. Ken, welcome back to NDE Radio. Well, good morning, Lee. It's great to be here. Oh, good to have you. Ken, you told us back in 2015 that your memories of future events began to come back to you with a dream that you were naked in church and God spoke to you. And you, you said at the time that you weren't ready for it, and yet your memory dreams of future events like the JFK assassination, the Twin Towers attack, and the 24... 20,004 tsunami came back to you before they happened. So why do you suppose God wanted you to remember these previews of things not yet happened? Well, that's a good question. I, I cause Over the years, I've asked myself many times, uh, why me? Um, because at the same time, when the memories came back, I do recall a moment when the visions were stopped and it was like three different times. And the teacher entity um, brought me to a certain point in history where the America was going through a lot of disruption. So they, she brought me to a point like three different times and stopped it and asked me, what will you do here? Hmm. And then I would give an answer, and if it wasn't appropriate, I would be run through it again. And I believe... I believe um, what she was showing me was at a moment in time that was extremely important, um, and she wanted to know what I would do. Would I help people, or would I just accept it, or would I try to influence people and make things worse? Hmm. So with all these interviews, I kind of feel like I'm at that point. But yet the this, this disruption that I saw was at an elevated level to the point where people were killing each other and there was pure hatred, and um, there was no safe place in America. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, question, I question all of it just as much as anyone else would, um, yet I want to be a positive influence and see if I can be helpful. That's sure. basically where I'm at. It, it's really interesting because the way you described it, 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 it seems like you were shown the Earth's history from the future looking back which means the things you saw can't be changed because they've already happened. Is that, is that right? Is that your understanding of it? Yeah, well, I came back with a real strong feeling that it can't really be changed, but yet if people help each other and love is involved, then the trauma and the disruption would not have to be as bad as what I saw. Mm. That people need to help each other because humanity has another step to go through, and I believe is to become much more spiritual and much more aware of the gifts that God has given all of us. Um, when, we, when we're destructive and hateful and we're hurting each other, we're on the wrong path. Right. Uh, when we judge each other, other harshly, we're on the wrong path. Um, when we're living through a, a love-based um, belief um, and... I don't know how else to put it. If if we're working through love, then uh, the natural events that are probably going to take place will not have to be so traumatic. And I'm I'm talking about 
uh, natural disasters. I believe mm-hmm. those things will probably happen whether we like <clears throat> excuse me whether we like it or not. Um, and I think the hate and the war and the destruction and the, the injuring each other that's just going to make it worse. Yeah. So if we're in the practice of helping each other and always reaching out an open hand and accepting each other, then if a natural disaster does happen, then we'll be better prepared to, you know, to deal with it. You said on a previous show that meditation helps restore some of the memories uh, of what you were shown. Do you suppose that if more people meditated that it would open up some of these channels of love that you're talking about? Yes, and, um, you know, meditation is such a simple thing to do. It, it relaxes the mind, and it leaves you open. Um, and then all the negative influences that we get through, like, the media, um, sometimes just talking to negative-focused people, you know, that are in our lives, it releases us from all that uh, negativity, and uh, it promotes health, uh, well-being. And then it's not so easy uh, for us to be influenced then to do harmful things um, or to judge others so harshly. We're more open and accepting. And so uh, meditation is a, is a great thing. Um, when I think back to my uh, early uh, exposure to religion when I was a child, um, I, I belonged to a, a Protestant church, and um, it was very standard pretty much a standard church across America. and uh, But we weren't really taught spirituality in, in depth. Uh, we were taught to pray. But I, I, re- I came out of all that exposure to that religion as being a little bit fuzzy. It's, there was an awful lot of talk about um, how we treat each other, which was good. But how, as an individual, to relate to God and to really connect and do as God commanded, that was another story. Um, mm-hmm. That was all kind of mysterious and foggy. And, and uh, it's, it, What's funny to me is the way society has developed is in the Bible, they talk about all kinds of spiritual encounters. Uh, I saw visions. Um, Jacob's Ladder, for example. Um, that, to me, was as a near-death experience. That, and, but these days, it's very mis- uh, mysterious and mystical. And it happened in the ancient times, but that doesn't happen today. God doesn't talk to us like that anymore. And if somebody steps out and says, hey, God spoke to me the other night, those people are scrutinized. They're not really believed. Um, So there's sort of a general consensus that we're separate from God. And gosh, how about that? We really are, because we're not thinking in the right way. Right, because we don't think that this is an ongoing conversation that, that God is providing to us. Uh, I, I know exactly what you mean, uh, and this is why religion generally uh, seems to shun uh, discussions of near-death experience, because it, it uh, usurps their authority. You know, if, if it's all Bible-based, then uh, the, the future prophecy or, or, or current conversations with God and visions and that sort of thing, just don't, they don't have a place for it, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, the general belief is it happened in the ancient times, but not now. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and maybe perhaps the entrance of Jesus into the history, um, and maybe a basic misunderstanding of what Jesus was trying to teach, has kind of separated us. It's like, now religion wants us to believe only what Jesus said, but we're not really doing it. Mm. Um, you know, I remember reading in the Gnostic Bible, um, I believe Jesus commanded the uh, make no laws. You who are my followers, make no laws, make no commands. In other words, no structure that regulates how other people act. That's not your place. Uh, you follow my word, and you love, and you give, and you support but pass no laws. Um, what is religion like today? Um, they're involved in our government. Yeah, it's they sponsor, all laws. They sponsor, they sponsor legislation that controls their lives, and they call it God's Word. They're totally off. 
It is, and it, it was uh, going on in Jesus' time, too, and he criticized the Pharisees for their hypocrisy and all of the talk about following this law and that law and all the Jewish laws as well as 1,600-plus laws that they had to offer. He was saying such a simple message. You know, it's it's love and charity, basically. Yeah. And that that's what God is looking for in us, and that's what we're looking for in him, as a matter of fact. You, you we're, uh, we're, also. We're, oh, go ahead. We're all ego. We're all equal in in God's eyes. We're all receiving the same amount of love and support from God all the time. It's whether or not we're living our lives in a way that we recognize it. That's the problem, and um, we need to start training each other again, or supporting each other in the idea that we're all spiritual, that all of God's gifts are available to us. So we have to respond to them. And there's all kinds of things um, interfering with us uh, that's stopping it. And money and greed, um, and then harsh judgment against others, you know, that interferes quite a lot. So It does. Uh, it, uh, I uh, To change the subject a little bit here, you had said in an earlier show that sometimes it seems to you that life on Earth is a, is like an illusion. And uh, I was wondering what you what you meant by that. Well, I've been through some really harsh times. Like uh, at one point, well, actually, most of my adult life, I worked for a major corporation, and I was just um, a cog, you know, mm-hmm. uh, just a just one of those people that uh, worked toward the ultimate goal that made the whole corporation successful. And I went through a lot of uh, being manipulated and pushed by management to do more, to do better quality. Um, but it, it felt an awful lot like I was being judged unfairly. And um, there were some really intense times where I had a few supervisors who were determined that I wasn't the right kind of guy to work here. We're looking for a certain kind of guy. And um, so my personal life was scrutinized several times. And there were a few times when um, I was put under the gun. I I was um, threatened but with uh, being fired. And uh, when things got really intense like that, it seems like they tend to use gear pressure. Mm -hmm. Gear pressure is one of their tools. If they can get uh, the people you work with to judge you harshly and, and harass you, then the ultimate goal is the corporation will succeed. And during those times, I would just sort of shut down and back up. It didn't even feel like I was in my body. I would just back up and look at the bigger picture, and I would just sit there and stay calm, stay calm, um, separate yourself from this. These people don't know what they're saying. They don't know how harmful they are. And I would just back up and step away from it. And somehow, over all those years, I never got fired. I never lost any wages. I always moved on to better jobs, better places, better supervisors, and everything worked out well. It's hard to do, but it's really the only way to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, corporate America is brutal, and um, it's like a pyramid. The people at the bottom are producing all, doing pretty much all the work, and all that product and all that, all the uh, rewards are being funneled up to the person at the top. Mm-hmm. And the person at the top has to make more money than anybody else because they're in charge. It's it's not it's not very uncharitable. Uh, the person at the top shouldn't make as much as they do. And the same goes for government. Why are they paid so much? What makes them so important? Especially when they do the bidding of corporations. Right. It's all backwards. Yes, they, it seems like they're all in the in the pay of corporations these days. Well, here's a here's sort of a related question, uh, taking you back to your your NDE. In the beginning phase of your NDE, you said you were out of your body in a dark place, and being persecuted by some bad boy spirits who meant you harm. But that vanished instantly when a being of light came to help you. So I was going to ask you, what what do you think about the nature of evil? Uh, is it just the absence of good, or is it a a real force in the universe to be reckoned with? What it felt like to me was um, God's light is the source of life. 
And in the dark place, there was very little light. So each spirit essentially belongs to God, to the Creator, but the spirits that reject the light and reject the, the love, uh, the life, have to stay in a dark place to survive. So evil is, is dark, and it's the exact opposite of God, which is light and life. So to me it felt like they chose to stay there. They did not recognize life. They did not recognize love. And it was like they were trapped. Um, now here I, can, I come along. I'm on the operating table. I'm barely alive. I'm in this dark place trying to figure out where I am, and I have a slight glow to me. I'm still receiving some of God's uh, love to sustain me. They resented me for it. It was like I intruded in their dark territory, so they wanted to extingu extinguish me. Mm. But we have, we have, humanity has a tool. Um, if we still retain a little bit of love, we still recognize God, and if we call out to God, then he sends angels to um, rescue us if we're trapped in a dark place. And that's exactly what happened to me. Um, <clears throat> when those dark spirits attacked me, um, they were trying to tear me apart and destroy me. They wanted to put out my light. But I called out to God, and suddenly an angel appeared. I was heard. Mm -hmm. So we can speak up and we can stop it. At least once we separate from our bodies and we're trapped, that's what happened to me. Yeah. Um, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. And in a way, it parallels being in a bad corporation where you're being mistreated, too. You step back, got your perspective, and let some light flow in. And uh, that that kept you um, operational, even in, under bad circumstances. And speaking of bad circumstances, of course, we've got to get to where the world is today. Um, in the December show, we talked a little about what what had evolved out of the election of the current administration and um and you talked a, a little about where it was going but may, maybe you could review that for um the audience and uh and then if there's anything that you've that you've come across since our show last december talk about that too well yeah a little more in depth a little more detail has come to me um i suppose a, a quick review is um, I saw a president that was evil and vile and um, very disruptive, argued with just about everybody. I do recall now that that president had, had blonde hair. I'm convinced that it's, it's Donald Trump. Mm. Um, so I saw a group of men approach him in the, what looked like the Oval Office, and he was sitting at his desk of power and authority, and he was removed. And he was taken outside of the of the building. Um, and then I saw him on the steps of a government building, so it's probably in Washington D.C., shaking his fist, extremely angry that he was pushed out, and causing people to riot. Um, and then I saw major riots taking place on the East Coast, a lot of disruption because of it, and people getting injured. But um, then shortly after that, that period gets really wound up, um, I saw Donald Trump uh, spinning some sort of disruption like a spinning spiral. And I've come to understand that means that the person will be probably get, um, well, probably passed on. And um, then next, I saw him in a hospital bed surrounded by family. And then after that, no more. So I take that to mean that um, shortly after he's removed from office, um, he won't live much longer. But what causes his death, his passing on, I have no idea. All I know is I saw him. It definitely looked like a hospital room. Then after that, the, the fighting continues, and there's more riots, uh, disruption between factions in America. And I saw what looked like some dark shadow, they're like silhouettes, people outside a building, and I asked, what's, 
what's going on here? What what is this place? And I was told it was it had to do something with information or um, broadcast or something of that nature. And I saw these dark silhouettes in the shape of humans sneaking around outside the building. And then there's like a major explosion. And then I saw the interior of one of the rooms in that building. And it looked like, it did look like um, uh, the typical setup of a TV studio. And uh, wires and boxes and things hanging from the ceiling. It was destructive. Um, and then I, I asked, well, why are these people doing this? Why are they so upset? And I was told um, that they don't understand uh, the information that they're being given. They're being misled. And that's what that's pretty much the message, as best as I can recall it. That's what I was told. Um, then eventually, uh, this destruction becomes so intense that it's like a civil war where people are fighting. Um, in the streets, but it mostly takes place um, in the eastern half of the country uh, and more so down in the southeast. Mm. And uh, then there's an army that comes in from the west. Uh, it looks like the Mississippi is like a dividing line in the country. And this, this army in the west, and I don't know what country they represent, um, they cross cross that line and they, they go into the east and eventually the people who are causing the most disruption uh, in the east are eventually defeated but before they're defeated um, I saw an additional portion to all this that I've not mentioned before and that was deep down in the southeast um, there's an organization of some kind it could be a government building I'm not real sure, but it was occupied by extremely evil men. And um, their intentions and their destructiveness and their leadership is finally exposed. And they're extremely arrogant people. They don't care what happens to the country. Um, and they think that all the destruction that they've caused is, is good. Like, it's what they've always wanted. I'm not so sure that they're really associated with our government. Um they could be influenced by um, foreign, they could have foreign influence, probably money as well. And I saw them, I, I heard them, and I saw them laughing arrogantly. I wish I could tell you what they sort of look like. <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting if I could identify certain people in our country today and tell you those are the people, but I can't. Yeah. Um, of I course, just, there have been, just, there, go ahead, there have go been, uh, you know, reports from our own um, uh, FBI and CIA and the, the the people that look into these things that the Russians have been influencing our elections and uh, and trying to disrupt things and trying to divide and conquer, not only yeah. here but in Europe as well. I don't know if that would be related to this. Well, you know, and you hear in the current news that we have all kinds of politicians who have accepted donation money that can be traced back to Russia. Perhaps some of it comes from China as well. It's almost as if our government representatives are for sale. They don't really, um, they don't appear to believe in the democracy and representing the people who elect them. They're representing whoever gives them the most money. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very frightening. It is. I mean, uh, a government is supposed to uh, resist all of that and be a third force in the world, you know, uh, as is the press as well, you know, and when all of that gets, if it gets compromised, there's just no defense against the, the powers that be. Yeah. It, to me, it seems like uh, the people who are a little more sophisticated, a little more open-minded and knowledgeable, they are the ones that can hear the, this media, uh, the stories and the way they're, they're uh, presented to us. They can kind of see through uh, the superficial sides of it. You know, they can sit back and say, well, I met people who feel this way, but they're not quite that bad. But the media has a way of making things more sensational. Mm. And, um, the people who are a little more sophisticated and a little more educated can see through it and not let, them, not let it influence them to a, to a point where they, they're, they're destructive and hurtful towards others. But then you have then you have uh, 
maybe a little less sophisticated people who just want to hang on to one judgment. Like, um, well, I can give you Hillary, for example. Oh, my God. There's just about... <laughs> when you're around a lot of conservative people, if you start talking a little bit of politics with them, one thing they all consistently say, at least in my experience, is they don't like Hillary. But they can't be real specific. They've heard so many things about her, they just don't believe there's, there could ever be anything good about her. But I've been looking through all that over all these years, and I've always seen that there was an agenda. There was something out there pushing a negative thought and feeling and judgment against her. And um, that can, this thing goes for her husband. And um, I don't understand why people are so willing to hang on to the negativity and not look at the positivity. The positive influence is what you really need to look at. That's where the real power is. Um, and it doesn't make you righteous or better than anyone else by holding a harsh judgment against others. It's the complete opposite. If you call yourself a Christian, that would be the complete opposite of what you've been taught. Right. So, I know. And I'm sorry. I, I'm, this session, I'm getting a little bit into politics, and I guess it's because right now I'm feeling really frustrated with it all because it doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> what? Okay. Well, to turn to uh, a slightly different subject, I know you've been working with Robert and Suzanne Mays um, uh, in their research on prophetic NDEs. I had them on the show a couple weeks ago, and, and I was wondering: Have you learned more um, in in working with them? Have you learned more about others' prophecies, and and how do they compare with yours? Um, the only one, well, Robert sent me a, 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 a section or a chapter, I suppose. Um, I think his name was Howard Storm. Yes. He talked about oh. the future. Yes. Um, his really falls in line with what I was shown, uh, the future beyond all the destruction. Um, I would have to say that what I've read, his falls closely in line with mine. Because uh, toward the end of my vision, I saw, well, I saw like a big explosion, and it wiped out the North America, wiped out all life. But then things started to grow again. Trees started to um, prop, come come back. And then I saw very simple people living in, in huts, little villages, very much like um, the American Indians that lived here before we all came over. And uh, very peaceful and uh, loving and very good lives, but very simple. You know, open fires and, um, you know, cooking out outdoors. Mm. Um, so the technology he went into was detail. gone? I'm sorry, ask the, me again? Oh, I was saying, so the technology had pretty much been destroyed and we were living a simpler uh, life again? Yes. A very simple life, very spiritual lives. And I think Howard Storm's description of, of the skills they acquire and the way they live, I, that falls right in line with what I was shown. Because when I was shown the vision of these people living their lives, cooking their meals, and being very happy, I was told, so see, Ken, all the destruction that you see, that you saw up to this point, all the strife and the uh, destruction that took place up to this point, now humanity is back on track. Now we're moving in the right direction again. So it's not the end. The destruction of the United States is not the end of it. It's actually a step toward a better way of living. Oh. And um, because I was very distraught when I first when I saw all the destruction and the fighting, I was very distraught. I didn't like it one bit. So oh, I think they showed me that future vision to let me know that um, things will get better. Well, that's. I'm glad we can end on a on a happier note. Um, we're out of time, Ken. Uh, once again, uh, thank you so much for for coming back on the show. Yeah, I'm not a religious leader. I I don't want people to follow me like an occult or anything. <laughs> I don't want that kind of influence. <laughs> but I'll, you ask me, and I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Ken, I I look forward. Um, Ken and I both plan to be at the upcoming IONS conference uh, outside of Philadelphia. I look forward to, to seeing you there. 
and uh, of course any of our audience as well. If they want to know more about that upcoming conference, go to iands.org. And if uh, anyone would like to listen to the show again or any of our past shows, go to our website at nderadio.org. And join us again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.